And we're live. Welcome to a very special Hope Residence 4 o'clock session today. We have the masterminds and visionaries behind 2000 Ocean, Shahab Carmeli, Enrique Norton, Edgardo De Fortuna, and Hope Living co-founder Seth Semeloff. We're going to give our viewers just a minute to log in and join us. So to open up, Shahab, Edgardo, Enrique, how's quarantine been for each of you so far? Shahab, starting with you. I'll go, um, I'll, I'll go first. We'll go, we'll go age before beauty. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I tell you, uh, you know, for all of us, this was unexpected. And uh, not to sound too corny, but the great American saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade out of it. I'm, I'm in better shape than I've been in a long while. I've learned to uh, uh, distinguish, and I hope it sticks. We'll see if it sticks after we come out of this pretty soon. I've learned to distinguish between what you need and, and what you want. And I have a new appreciation for our constitutional rights and the Bill of Rights and how we should always be very wary and aware of, of moments such as this where for some reason or other they're being infringed upon. And I have a greater appreciation for that today than I did two months ago. And I'm grateful as always. Thank you, Shahab. Over to you, Edgardo. I, I feel very fortunate to be able to, to spend uh, the lockdown in Miami. I, it's been a wonderful weather. The, I'm living on a home in TV Spain, having my three children uh, going at school from home. Uh, it really made me appreciate what we have and we sometimes don't value as much. I mean, I haven't been working at home uh, forever. I mean, we built this house eight years ago and have a wonderful office and stuff that I never ever used before. And now I'm constantly here and I'm really communicating with, with everybody and all the team at Fortune has been doing a great job and trying to stay in touch and, and really uh, servicing both the customer and the broker community. So we, um, Obviously, we'd love to get back to normal, but it hasn't been uh, as drastic as as people uh, perceive it to be. And in really, uh, being in Miami is a blessing. Thank you, Edgardo. Enrique, how about you? Well, I, I must add myself to saying that we're that I'm lucky. You know, fortunately, we're all good. Uh, we're all safe. Uh, we we have been the same as Edgardo just mentioned and Shahab, we've been able to keep on working on our projects. We haven't, you know, the projects are moving uh, very well, as a matter of fact, we're very, very busy. And uh, I must say, I, the only thing I miss very much are to be able to hug my friends, my children who are, who are abroad, you know, my family. Uh, but besides that, I'm doing very well and, and I feel very lucky as well. Thank you, Enrique. So we're going to go ahead and introduce you to each of our, all of our viewers. Enrique, beginning with you. Enrique sure. Norton comes the formidable design team behind 2000 Ocean alongside lead architect and partner, Andrea Steele. Founded by Norton, 10 Architectos boast a portfolio of more than 60 landmark museums, libraries, public parks, residences, hotels, and universities in cities around the globe, each designed to improve urban living. Welcome, Enrique. Thank you, thank you very much. Next, we have Shahab Carmeli. As the founder of Car Properties, LLC, and through Car and or its affiliates, Mr. Shahab Carmeli has acquired, repositioned, and monetized over 3 million square feet of office, luxury mixed use, an industrial space in the US, Southeast Asia, and Europe. With offices in New York and Miami, Carr currently oversees the management of a core portfolio of assets and a development pipeline in excess of 5 million square feet. Welcome, Shahab. Happy to be here. Always great to see you. And last but not least, Edgardo Di Fortuna. Edgardo Di Fortuna is president, CEO, and founder of Fortune International Group, a Miami-based full-service real estate firm recognized throughout South Florida, Latin America, and Europe as a leader in high-end luxury real estate. He oversees all of the company's activities, all of its business units. 
Mr. DiFortuna brings over 30 years of experience in the real estate industry and is considered to be a visionary and a driving force in South Florida real estate. Welcome, Ricardo. Thank you very much, April. I appreciate the introduction. Thank you to each of you for being here with us today. Now I'd like to introduce Seth Semeloff, who is the co-founder of Hope Media Group, Hope Living. He's going to be moderating for us today. You're on mute, Seth. <laughs> He's ready. Thank you so much, April, and thank you, Eduardo. Um, so Shahab, I'd love to hear from you if you could talk to us a little about 2000 Ocean and about the partnership uh, that you built uh, with Eduardo and Enrique. It'd be great to hear from you, the creator. So uh, I want to thank, uh, of course, Eduardo and Enrique for making the time, putting the time aside to join me on this webinar. Hot Living has always been a great partner for us. I think uh, uh, one of the reasons I have invested as much as I have in, in uh, Florida, South Florida, along with my partner, and our uh, uh, wind behind our back, entering into the luxury sector there, our partners like Hot Living, who have exemplified what Miami has evolved into in the past five to 10 years, uh, in terms of quality of offerings, the cultural activities, and the international city that it's become. So it's great to be here with you guys, and thank you for hosting us. Um, 2000 Ocean is, is, is a, almost a uh, pet project, uh, for me, uh, it's cliche to say, but I will say you're only as good as your partners and team members. And uh, as uh, I started, as I came across this opportunity, and I, I came to understand what Hallandale is, and how unique this location on the beach is, and what's possible there, the first step uh, was to find uh, a, a, an architect whose vision is really what uh, uh, brings a project to life who uh, could, could express what we wanted to achieve here. And I was familiar with Enrique's work. I had not had the pleasure of meeting him in person yet. We were introduced by a mutual friend who actually used to be working for me. And I had one dinner and I walked over and I said, you know, I know, I always knew he's talented and brilliant. I had no idea he's such a charming man. Mm -hmm. He's such a human quality to him. And, and uh, the, ultimate, the ultimate expression of a successful development is when people feel like you've given them a new home. Uh, they, they walk in and say, I am home. This is where I want to be. And Enrique, both through his vision, his, his, his brilliance, but also the way he views the world and his interaction with people. He just said he misses hugging his, his friends and he means it. He's not just saying that. Has somehow expressed that brilliantly uh, in this building. And as far as, uh, as, far as uh, who would be the right partner to help us sell, uh, these unique residences. There's no second choice on an Edgardo. I'm not just saying that because he's online with me. I actually speak more highly of him when he's not around than when he is around, but there is no second. And his unique set of uh, talents in, in, in both the sale of the best product in Miami, but also the developer himself. He brings an understanding perspective from both angles of the industry, and, and we could not be happier in having him and his excellent firm as our partner in the sales effort uh, in this project. Enrique, what was your vision for designing 2000 Ocean? Walk us through your design process. Well, uh, there, there, obviously, you know, architecture is more complex than that and there are many sort of layers and I would try to simplify uh, some of them first. I wanna go back to a little bit to what Shahab and uh, uh, just said. You know, and, and I think the, the, the beauty or, or one of the big assets of this project is the team that you just mentioned. You know, obviously, you know, I met Shahab before I met Edgardo. As a matter of fact, I met Edgardo in a completely different condition. I didn't meet him through this project specifically. But what both of them have is a tremendous appreciation and love for good architecture, you know, for, for, for really a good expression of architecture, a good uh, a process of construction, a good use of materials and details. You know, they understand the tectonic process of architecture. And that's what makes basically this project quite unique and very special. Now, going back to, to your question, uh, since the very beginning, you know, we understood that 
obviously one of the issues here, one of the main issues here was the location. Uh, uh, the location is quite special and quite different. You know, not all of the eastern coast of Miami Beach or, or, or Miami, I would say, of the, of the big peninsula, the big island, is the same. They're all quite different, as a matter of fact. And Hallandale is different to any other part of it. You know, Hallandale is different to all of its neighbors. It's different, obviously, to all of the Miami beaches. It's different to anything that's happening around there. And the beaches are also different. I wouldn't say, you know, it's not a different light, maybe it's not a different sort of physical condition, but it's a very different spirit. And it's obviously a, a spirit, I would say a spirit, a spirit that is much more family oriented, that is much more community oriented. And it was important to understand that people, because everybody that buys or decides to live in, in the coast of Florida has many options. You know, they could go and buy from Edgardo any of his other uh, fantastic projects that he has built nearby. But this is different. And it's different, one, because of its location. You know, people that are not looking to live, you know, across the street or nearby the shopping mall or that not looking to live in Miami Beach or that are not looking to live in Aventura or whatnot. You know, they're looking for a different condition. So understanding that that's a different market is very special. Having said that, there were other issues that, you know, I've been sort of looking for, you know, I happen also to have an apartment in, in Miami, you know, I spent time in Miami. And one thing that I've noticed is that even the most contemporary uh, apartments or, or, or projects in Miami have a strong barrier or detachment from the, from the biggest asset, which is the environment, you know, which is the ocean, which is the beach, which is the air, you know, and, and, and one of the biggest motivation, and we discussed that with Shahab, is how to create a product that would be much more integrated to everything that naturally surrounds a, a, each one of these residences. You know, we spent, a, a, so therefore, there, I would say there are two very important drivers in this project. One, to understand the, co the, 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 the community life of this a, a project of this building. Now, this building is not just another object sitting, a, you know, independently and isolate, isolated from everything else. A, and the people that are going to live there are people that probably are willing both to have their individuality, of course, and have their privacy, of course, but also be part of a community, a community of peers. So there was a big a, emphasis in designing all of those moments and all of those opportunities of communal encounters, I would say, of community living within the building. And I think that is quite uh, accomplished and distinguishes it from many other buildings. And the other thing was to design the units in a way that, uh, as you may know, and sorry, you know, that, for example, all of the units have 180 degrees views, you know, every unit, you know, even the small units, obviously the big units have 360 degrees views, but even the small units have a relationship both with the ocean, with the beach, with, with that kind of nature, but they also have a relationship with the city, you know, with the, with the more urban parts. They have a relationship both east and west. And that's a very unique condition in these kinds of buildings. The other thing, as you can see in the, in the, in the things you're, you're now showing, is that sort of almost ethereal envelope. Ethereal, but at the same time, protected envelope that sort of engulfs the spaces. You know, it's so ethereal that basically you will be able to enjoy both the interior and the interior, the exterior at the same time. The public and the private with a big blurring of that a division, like that envelope that sort of engulfs the, the, the residences is, does not separate, is not a, a it, that's not what defines the space. The space uh, flows uh, uh, continuously. So you can be inside, but you're outside, or you can be outside, but you're also inside. And at the same time, you're protected. 
And based on those principles, we designed the building that is now presented to you. I want to touch on um, which you said was the most important part to Eduardo about the location. Tell us what makes the location perfect for the project. Well, as you know, Seth, Miami is getting to, to find the right side on the ocean. And like Enrique was saying, in contact with nature, it, it's very hard today to find a, a site that is empty and that has the ability to build a building of these characteristics. I mean, Hollandale is, is positioned very, very well because it's a very residential neighborhood, but it's 10 minutes away from Aventura, 15, 20 minutes away from Bell Harbor. And if you want the activities of South Beach, uh, then you have it there uh, very in close proximity, but then you can come back to your, your really heaven uh, on earth and, and be in a private setting with a building that it was designed as homes in the sky. I mean, the, this building, especially today, we value uh, the, the meaning of home. And, and really, it, it, in this building, having only 60 plus units, uh, all at least half floors, if not full floors, becomes really a very private, very intimate uh, residence for the, the buyer. And in a location that, that is a, hand on hand with everything that Miami has to offer. So the combination of those factors and, and the ability to design it in the way that you're in constant uh, contact with nature and be able to both see the ocean, feel the, uh, the, um, the ambience of the ocean and the water, uh, but also being able to see the city views and, and be in contact with, with the overall life of Miami is very, very attractive and, and it, it really, it's presented as a great value because if you're going down to South Beach, um, the units of this magnitude will be two or three times the, the price of, that we're selling these units for. So the combination of factors makes the location and the product so special that it really was very attractive to me. And that's why I love when Shafab contacted me and, and said, can you help us uh, do this? And I really fell in love as soon as he took me to the cell center because the you, the, from the moment you walk into the site, uh, you really feel it. You really feel what Enrique was mentioning, the contact, uh, the special place in, in, in an area where, where you can be in the middle of the city, but also uh, totally secluded and surrounded by, by nature. Shahab, you are obviously, um, you, you put the investment into the property in Hollandale, so you saw the vision. Tell us what made you pick that spot over a traditional Miami Beach or downtown or Brickell for this project? Uh, the, the initial uh, attraction was, of course, it was a unique site on the beach. And, uh, you know, we're always site hunting. All of us are always site hunting. It's like kind of being on uh, endless uh, Tinder looking for oceanfront sites in Miami. But I came across this site. Uh, and what was immediately unique about it was the ability to have a building in which you have these uninterrupted views, not only to the ocean, of course, because any ocean front building has uninterrupted views to the east, but because of the surrounding low rise buildings that were there already, I immediately saw that we can have a unique, unique circumstance here where whether they're half floor units and you know, we have half floor units and a handful of full floor units. Uh, you, not only do you have unobstructed views to the ocean, which is to the east, but behind us, which to the west of us, the intercoastal, which is beautiful, especially with the sunsets, unobstructed views. And because of the, uh, the, the building envelope had already been approved in terms of location, we purchased it uh, and, and we solidified it during the time that we had ownership of it. We eventually were able to solidify its placement on, on the beach further east of the surrounding buildings. So now you have a very unique uh, situation where you have uninterrupted views, not only east and west, but also north and south, depending on whether you have a full floor or half floor. So that was kind of very uh, immediately obvious to me. And as I understood how and did I, and I liked the kind of a, the, the chill, low key atmosphere of Hollandale. And I've said this before, it, you know, it reminds me in a way of Malibu, it reminds me in a way of, of these high end, but not highly developed uh, neighborhoods as, as, you know, as contrast to some of the more high octane neighborhoods of Miami, which are exciting in their own, but they tend to be very dense with a lot of activity going on. And, and this is the, the, the location 
between Fort Lauderdale and Miami, having equal access to two great airports, having this kind of chill, sleepy town of Hallandale, which since then has, you know, has, has, has grown uh, a fair amount, but still has that vibe to it, which is, which is relaxed. And, and that offering us the ability to create homes in the sky. And, and Golden Beach, which is an immediate vicinity to us, was another calling card for me. So I remember as I was deciding uh, to you know, buy this property, I would drive through Golden Beach and say, you know, this, is, this really reminds me of Beverly Hills. There's that iconic shot of everybody in all the movies as they drive into Beverly Hills. You see that. And then there's this iconic shot of Palm Beach. The first time people go to Palm Beach, there's a shot of that. And driving through Golden Beach to Hallandale, leaving you know, the buzz and excitement of South Beach and, and Bar Harbor behind, but having them right immediate to you, but you know, far away from you where you feel like you're in a more uh, relaxed setting. It goes, all of that really spoke to me. And, and based on that, I thought there's a possibility to create something which looks at, at the amazing homes that are at Golden Beach and say, how can we replicate these at a you know, better value because it's a high rise in a building in which you have the views, you have that texture, you have the nature, you have all the, the square footage that you would have in a luxury home combined with you know, the endless conveniences of living in a high rise building from security services, you know, so on and so forth. And, and you know, it, it took, me, took me a good you know, couple of months to come to terms with that. And then you know, we paid the price and we bought the site. So. Enrique, how did you incorporate the natural surroundings into your design process? Well, you know, uh, as I said before, you know, in, uh, uh, you, uh, the, the challenge would have been how to really uh, uh, not have uh, any solid conditions that would separate you from the surroundings. The surroundings is not only the view of the ocean, but it's also the air, it's also the sounds, it's also, as Shahab just said, both the sunrises and the sunsets, you know, it's the, the whatever urbanity that exists in the surrounding. So uh, there's basically two things. One, by creating this very ethereal envelope. Second, by extending as much as possible the opportunity of exterior spaces. Uh, and I would say probably third is the possibility uh, in understanding that when you buy an apartment or when you rent an apartment or whatever, you don't only buy the square feet that are inside the glass. You're really buying everything that the project offers you. So here, by the extension of the public spaces of the project, of the amenities of the project, of, uh, of the design of all of that, I think the extension of the, of the natural uh, experience becomes much more important than just buying a little nest or a little box in within a collection of boxes, which other places would be. Beautiful. I mean, this is, I mean, I like the way you, um, you designed it using a lot of green too. Can you touch upon that? Well, you know, uh, uh, obviously when uh, uh, green is important, uh, plants are very important. Plants are life. Plants, plants are part of our environment. Uh, we all appreciate being surrounded by that. And obviously we, we work with a very a good a landscape team that has helped us to create that kind of green environment uh, in, and bring it into our uh, bring it into our project. Eduardo, um, obviously we're in different times right now. I mean, you've been in you've been in real estate for a long time. How are you guys? marketing the, the product to consumers. I mean, usually you get calls all over the world, but you, you know, the, the airports, you can't come in from Latin America. So how are you guys marketing the projects in, in this tough times of the coronavirus? Well, Seth, as you know, we've, we've been marketing to the world, Miami to the world for a very long time. And, and, and like you said, most of the time we, we travel, but, but still, we had to, when we travel to Latin America or to Europe or wherever we're presenting the project, we are always having to sell the dream because most of the time, especially in pre-construction, the building is not yet built. So we created way before this issue occurred, uh, the tools to be able to show or to, to really have 
the buyer experience that dream and to be able to to really realize what the building is all about and what the spaces and the public areas look like. So uh, it's really, of course, we're today we're missing the human touch and to be able to um, to really meet person to person and the chemistry sometimes is very important. But but we've been able to communicate with all our broker network constantly, even more than before. I would venture to say because everybody is sitting at home and and we have done this type of of presentations all over the world and on a constant basis. The, the teams have assigned um, numbers of, of areas and people to, to be in, in touch with. And the, the real, really the, the list, uh, the, the prospective list that we have is, is very significant. And we've been able to even, uh, because of the, of the sheer uh, scarcity of this type of product, there's only 60 plus units. People know that they need to act now because if not, the units that they like are not going to be available. I mean, we, we were negotiating a combination unit, and and if you don't, if they don't make up their mind now, the two two units one next to the other are not going to be able to be available anymore. So, um, the, there are still transactions being made, and and really, uh, people can really understand uh, everything that we're selling by us showing them the virtual tours and and all the, the tools that we have. So it's, it's really um, not, uh, the process of selling hasn't suffered that much. And certainly the, the finishing of the transaction might have to wait a little bit until they can visit us and, and they can sign on the dollar line. But, but the process of sales has been very, very seamless. And, and like I said, in some cases, even more active now than before uh, we were uh, needed to lock down. And where are a lot of the buyers or the leads coming from? Is it coming northeast? Uh, where are they where are they coming from now? Yeah, I mean, it, the, really, we try to reach a, a global a type of public. But but today, the northeast and the Canadians, New Yorkers, um, people from uh, Boston are are really uh, very very active in searching for for properties in Miami. I mean, even before this, uh, the the tax situation in the Northeast has really created a big influx of, of Northeasterners looking to, to establish residency in Miami. But, but if you look at Mexico today, I mean, for the last year, a, a lot of the actions, you know, the political actions of the Mexican government has created a big influx of, of Mexican capital to the US and Miami is a very natural place for them. Same thing with Brazil. Um, we. Um, maybe for a little bit different reasons, but we see an influx of, of buyers coming from Brazil. So uh, the, the natural buyer, which was the, the Latin American buyer, uh, really still there uh, for, for different reasons. But now uh, the big strong market uh, seems to be coming from, from the US and, and, and our Canadian friends in the North because uh, the lifestyle is significantly better here for, for many reasons, including tax reasons. Shahab, um, in your opinion, what type of buyer will be most attractive to 2000 Ocean? So uh, the type of buyer, I would break it down for you by two types of categories. Uh, one is the use type and one is where they're coming from. So uh, picking up on what uh, Eduardo was alluding to, one of the, uh, one of the significant uh, changes in, in the coming to age of Miami and Miami truly becoming an international city. And you guys at Hot Living, you've, you've experienced this yourself firsthand, is that, uh, you know, Miami, when Miami was, to be first was an international city, previously, it really meant it had a very strong, wonderful, vibrant Latin flavor. And for various political reasons, financial reasons, uh, it has been an inflow uh, of, of capital uh, from Latin America. But over the last seven to 10 years, uh, that has significantly broadened into including the entire world, uh, waking up and taking Miami uh, seriously as a place, uh, not just to visit, but to live and invest in. I, in our sales center, um, I personally, I, I've spent not, not, not too much time, but a fair amount of time. I have been there when we've had uh, buyers not only from Latin America, New York and Canada, but from Italy, from France, from Serbia, from Poland. 
it's from from Russia. It's it's it's. it's I'm always amazed at how international Miami has become. So uh, I think geographically, uh, still Latin American buyers tend to make up the bulk of the market, but certainly Northeasterners, New Yorkers, because of tax reasons and also quality of life reasons. You know, taxes may 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 encourage you to look at Miami. They certainly have encouraged me and a lot of my friends. But if the lifestyle is not there, uh, you you know. There, there are very few people that will change where they live just for taxes if, if the other factors weren't there. I think taxes make you look at a place like Miami, same as myself. I started looking at it and it took me a while to realize that Miami is just not fun because, you know, God knows I've had a lot of fun in Miami in my younger years. But you start looking at it about what a great place it is to live in, the beaches, the natural beauty, and now the cultural offerings of Miami, which have really put it, you know, on par with any city in the world. And, and secondarily, as Enrique was mentioning and the discussions we had early on, the idea with 2000 Ocean was always to create a select handful of homes for people who want to live there or spend a significant amount of time. So your sense of arrival, as you saw with that beautiful podium that Enrique has uh, brilliantly designed, he convinced me that the lobby should be elevated. I was kind of resisting him in the beginning. And he said, no, your sense of arrival of climbing and arriving at this point of arrival work your lobby is up in the air and you're looking across the ocean uh, to the, uh, each home has its own individual elevator landing to the several swimming pools that we have and the amenities that we have, uh, our spa, our, our, our gym, our uh, owner's lounge, uh, our beach club. All of those speak to people who wanna have a home, who want to enjoy living in this, in this in this home in the sky, which allows them complete privacy while giving them access to nature right at their fingertips. And, uh, you know, Enrique can, can speak about this more, but I'll just give you an anecdotal fact. Our half floor residences are close to 3,000 square feet. And 3,000, and that's just the interior. And as Enrique said, when you're buying a home, in a building, you're buying not just the square footage within the glass, but everything else that comes with it. So when you consider 3,000 square feet of absolute usable space on one level, it's really like a two-story average 5,000 square foot home because you don't have the loss of the stairs, the mechanical areas. So you, you know, in a relatively large home, you have access to two swimming pools and all the other amenities that we mentioned, the security of the building, your outdoor space on the beach, and and at great value. I, you know, one of the things that we always talk about and it hasn't come up here yet, is let's also not forget that among all the wonderful things that we are pointing out about Miami and leaving many that uh, we can add to, let's not also forget what great value uh, Miami in general is and this building is. You know, when, when you consider what you're paying to get Enrique Norton, to get these homes in the sky, glass tower, all these amenities, Minotti as our design partner. The list is you know, kind of very uh, voluminous and, and visiting our website can show you. And at the price that we're able to offer this at, it's, it's, it's a tremendous value. And that's another thing that I think people more and more are realizing about uh, our project and these projects it is on top of the beauty and the location, what great value they are. And, and you know, that, that has been a big driving force for a whole variety of buyers from the U.S., from Canada, and as I mentioned, from, from Europe and other parts of the world. Shahab, I mean, obviously to get Enrique's a home run for you, do you remember the day when you guys first met and you pitched him the idea? Um, I mean, I got to believe it's a great story. Do you, do you want to share where you You know, I, I had the, this very charming Brazilian girl who uh, used to work for uh, Rafael Vignoli, actually, another, another great architect, and, and she had come to work for me and uh, I, was, I was kind of thinking about a list of architects for this uh, uh, project. I wanted somebody with a unique vision. And uh, she said, you know, I'm very good friends. I said, look, Enrique Norton, I said, look, I've always admired his work because I, I tend to find Mexico City architecturally a wonderful city. There's some great examples of great architecture. You know, when people think about Mexico City, they don't realize amongst the traffic and the pollution and on the side of there's some really great architecture there. And she said, look, I'm, I'm friends with him. Why don't we have dinner together? And then we went and had dinner at a restaurant around the corner from my office in New York on 36th and, and 5th. It's called I Fiori. It's just a very nice Italian restaurant, although I always have the hamburger there. They have great burgers. 
And, and as I said, you know, what was going to be a, a short dinner became a very long dinner. We found that we had, the world is always small, and we found that we had friends in common. And, and I, he, I found them to be so naturally charming and so likable that after that, it was not at all a question of, of if he should be the architect for us, is when can we get going with him as an architect with us on this project? And, and that's, that's uh, we kind of, you know, went from there. And uh, uh, it, it, uh, it turned out to be a very good decision on my part. I hope he feels the same way. I hope it was a good decision on his part as well. But uh, the collaboration has been wonderful. Enrique, how many projects have you built in your career? Have I built in my life? Yeah, in your career, how many projects have you? I, I don't even know. I don't even know. I can tell you it's built projects, probably over 60 projects, you know, all over America, around the world. So I, I, don't, I don't keep a, a count on the number of projects. You're very humble and your work is amazing. Thank um, you. What makes this special? I mean, obviously you have 60 kids. What makes this special out of the other projects you built? You know, every project is special. Every project is special for many issues, for many, many issues. You know, it's, and as you said, that's, that, that's a, good, a good comparison. You know, I, every one of our projects is like a child to us, you know, and you love them all for different reasons. You love them all and you hate them all, you know, for different reasons. You know, but at the end, you love them and they're part of your family. And at the end, they're part of your legacy. And as I said before, there are many reasons why, why I would love this project. Uh, one is for the, for the personal and human relationships. And I do mean it. I do mean it. You know, you were asking Shahab about the first time we met. I can tell you, you know, that, you know, when you start meeting a, a new client, it's a new life. It's almost like a, like a courting thing. It's almost like a first dating thing. You know, you want to start seeing if you will be able to sort of quote unquote, don't take me wrong, Shahab, but marry this person, <laughs> you know? Like, because it's a very long uh, relationship. You know, Shahab and I have been now in this relationship for years, it's several years. And I feel very proud and very happy that I can be here, you know, see, looking at Shahab in the eyes and knowing I have a friend, you know, I know, the most important thing, and that's the next thing. Why do I like this project so much? One, because, you know, I've been visiting this project periodically. You know, unfortunately, I wish I could be in Miami more often now, but I will, I'm coming back, so don't worry. I'll be there and, yeah. and hustle you, so don't worry. And it's amazing, you know, the, the project is being built impeccably, impeccably. The, the, the quality of everything is, is really great. You know, I would encourage any one of our listeners, if they are in the Miami area, to take a drive to the project and to arrange. I, I'm sure there's a way to arrange that they can probably come into the site. I don't know how that works, but if they can arrange to come into the site and just visit the site, you know, it's a site that it's clean, it's ordered, the details are impeccable. You go and look at, for example, the, the concrete pourings and they're impeccable. You know, the, the, the construction company is doing a great job. And the people that Shahab has on site, both, I would say, our architectural partners that are following up with construction administration day to day, and the people that are following with Shahab with a, basically the construction itself of the building are doing a tremendous job. So that makes me be very proud of this project. And then of course, you know, it's, it's, it, the location is unique and therefore, you know, it's our only project in that part of the world that makes it also unique. We've had great encouragement and I should say that through the design, designing a project with Shahab, I would say it's not easy because Shahab is a person that demands rightfully very much and it, keeping up to his expectations, which I admire because that's what many developers should be doing, is not easy. It was a tremendously good process. Uh, Shahab would bring in his insight and his vision, his vision constantly. He would question constantly the project, which only made us excel more. And I think at the end, 
we all came out with a with a product that we we will all the three of us be very proud i know that edgardo came up to the project a little later when the project was basically almost all designed but when i heard that edgardo was coming up to the project i felt very proud because i've been visiting myself you know projects of other colleagues of mine that i admire in florida which have the fortuna signature so being part also of that family for me was a a, a, a issue of pride and an issue of of of, uh, of of really appreciating that i would be part of that family so working with people that appreciate architecture that know architecture and very especially that know the quality of good architecture and that would push you for that quality it's very unique believe me you don't get those kinds of developers those kinds of brokers very often there are very few of them well i want to go to you eduardo um because enrique said it best when we put the du fortuna signature on this building um what makes this building special to you i mean you 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 know them all so what makes this special I really appreciate what Enrique said, and 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 know Shahab is always very complimentary of us. But but we really uh, love great design. We love attention to detail, and we love to try to understand what the customer is looking for. So it's very very important for me that the both the architect and the developer really understand that and and put their stamp to it. So um, when I saw. I mean, I, I had the fortune of selling another project that Enrique designed in, in South Beach called One Ocean. Uh, that was a very difficult project because it was not on the beach. It was across the street. It was a, a restaurant in between the site that he had to deal with. And he really came up with the perfect solution. It sold for even higher prices than the projects on the beach. And, and really, uh, because his vision and what he could do with the product, it really made a difference to the buyer. So I, I knew what I was, I was getting into when uh, Shahab invited me to, uh, to visit the project and to see if we could uh, really sell it for him. The, the notion that he was doing a very private boutique type building with a really direct contact with the ocean and the beach and the pool and the, and the common spaces and the attention to detail that Shahab is known for putting in every single one of his projects, plus the combination of Enrique and Minotti doing uh, some of the interiors, really was a no-brainer. Of course, uh, we said yes in a minute, and and he stopped it by saying, "I really, I know you're going to sell it. I really don't even need uh, to uh, to sense that to get the 50% pre-sales. I'm going to start construction on this project immediately." Of course, we sold a bunch of units anyway but but he really put his money where his mouth was and and now the building is top off it's incredible i mean and certainly what enrique was saying we'll love to accommodate people to take them up to uh, we're going to have a, a model unit very soon that we're going to be able to take people up to to see some of the finishes but but certainly now we can visit and and get a sense of what those those true views are and those size of these units are because they're really spectacular. So this is for the discerning buyer that understand what it's buying and really understands attention to detail and quality of finishing and quality of work. Shahab is very, very picky as Enrique was saying on really demanding that the quality of the work it's, it's second to none. And he even uh, loved the way that we did J Signature so much that hired the same company soft of construction and the same team that was at Jade, uh, he really can't take them to, to build this building. So the combination of all those factors makes it a very, very outstanding product. And it really makes me very proud to be in company with these two gentlemen. And we um, Shahab talked about it, but go back to you, Eduardo. Um, how is it priced with other buildings in Miami? Because for, there's a lot of amenities and it's priced well. Um, can you talk about that? Really, this is very, very well amenitized. I mean, for 60 plus units, uh, the, I've never seen a building that has so many amenities for, for a boutique type building. I mean, they have the ability to to put everything that the sophisticated buyer needs in terms of spa, double pools, I mean, pools, sunset pool and, 
and Sunrise Pool, uh, because in South Florida, unfortunately, your own building blocks the sun in the afternoon. So people used to complain about it. And so they came, Enrique came up with the idea of putting a, a pool on top of the garage. So you have a, a sunset pool that is as attractive as, uh, as on the other side with the great amenities. And, and really, uh, the, the, the price in comparison to South Beach, as I was saying, it's in South Beach, you can probably pay triple the price for this quality building. And even in Sunny Isles or Royal Harbor, you pay double the price that you would pay for this building. And people appreciate it. The, the ones that know value really are, are really coming to this building and appreciating and embracing it. Because uh, if you want a home uh, really in the sky with a very private access directly into your unit from your own elevator, uh, this is the building for you to choose. Shahab, um, how has COVID-19 affected construction on the project for you guys? Um, fortunately, we have been able to continue construction, but of course, we very early on, in partnership with Suffolk Construction, who have done a tremendous job of, of taking this seriously and being on top of it very early on, um, besides the obvious social distancing, limiting the number of uh, uh, people in the elevators, making sure temperatures are taken. At, we actually take them more than once a day, you know, we take on arrival and midday. Um, uh, handling deliveries differently, making sure masks, uh, gloves, sanitizers, every floor. And uh, there is a person who has been added to the team. Their sole job is just to make sure that all of these practices are being followed. And so far, we've been blessed and we've been fortunate to have a a healthy uh, job site in terms of COVID. Uh, inevitably, uh, we have experienced some minor delays in supply chains because as you know, our partners are based in Italy. So uh, kitchens, bathrooms, doors uh, between Minotti, Minotti Cucina, and Lualdi and our other Italian partners come from overseas. Uh, but I, 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 I think in conjunction with Suffolk, we're going to make up the lag time on that and actually stay on schedule. So far, we're very much on schedule. Other than that is uh, uh, safety first, as always on any construction site, just not because of COVID, but you know, construction sites are dangerous places and you wanna always have safety first. And that has been the impact to us. The greatest impact uh, has been, uh, but it's going to be what's, what's going to come out of this now. Nobody can predict very 100% accuracy what some of the behavioral impacts on people is going to be as a result of this. Um, in this case, we're fortunate enough that the fear of the pandemic was greater than the pandemic itself. Um, this is probably a good, you know, lesson to be learned there. But uh, it's interesting, I was actually having this discussion with Enrique last week. And I say, you know, it's interesting that some of the elements that we have in this building that we incorporate at Seth, in terms of my belief in what luxury is. You know, luxury, everybody uses the word luxury, like everybody uses the word genius in Hollywood. You know, Elon Musk is a genius. I don't know all the guys at the Oscars who call themselves geniuses, I think. And, and luxury, everybody calls projects luxury, but luxury has to have a functionality, aesthetics, and quality all wrapped into one. You cannot have luxury just because you say it's luxury. You know, you can't self-identify that way. And uh, the fact that we have elevated lobby. Uh, the fact that we have individual elevated landings, the fact that we have uh, technology which allows you to enter the building, get into your elevator, not touch a single surface, right? So we had uh, early on, we had uh, a AI technology that does identification of your face or fobs so contactless. The fact that I always believe that healthy, healthy living is also part of luxury living. So the way we set up our earth circulation apartments, which is very atypical of Miami. You know, most Miami projects circulate the air that's on the inside and just assuming that the windows are open, fresh air is going to come in. But we designed this like we did not a lot of projects to have fresh air input, outtake circulation and discharge of, of air outside of the units of the outdoor environment. So many of the factors that I think people are going to want to incorporate in, in terms of air quality, in terms of uh, contact, uh, density reduction, and the fact that this is a boutique building with very few residents makes it much easier for us. In, in fact, 
we designed a post-COVID world in terms of, of, of density, lack of density, in terms of the ability to en engage in biometrics to, if you don't want to touch surfaces and not to touch surfaces, in terms of our mechanical system to discharge air within the apartment, bring in fresh air on a constant basis. Uh, we incorporate those factors as in our belief in what luxury means and, and what you should deliver. And those very factors are, our elements, our design elements, which I think people going forward are going to have to consider if there is a fear of pandemic and contact and density. And, and I think Enrique can speak a little bit more about that as well. I wanted to also ask Enrique, because you touched upon it, um, to describe the difference between um, the East and the West pool decks. You build pool decks for two different suns or weathers. Tell us a little about the thought process to that. That's kind of cool. Yeah, well, uh, obviously, you know, the, the, what every building does is to put the pool on the beach. You know, that's the natural thing, which is uh, understandable. You know, people like to spend part of their day, especially when they're on vacation, on weekends, you know, sitting around the pool, you know, and, and sort of going and coming between the pool and the beach. Or even people that prefer sitting on a deck, but not uh, looking at the ocean, but not necessarily being in a, where the sand is, you know? So that was a natural one. What's important about that pool also is not only its location, but also its a, a, a extension into part of the building. You know, we have proposed and created a, a space that is all, all sort of like aleatory, a, alien, a, a, it's added, I would say it's added to the, to, to the space, to the open space of the building that allows people that want to have the same, you know, want to have the sense of the ocean, want to have the sense of the beach, but don't want to sit on the beach or on the pool, still have the opportunity to be protected and to be part of that sort of communal experience or natural experience by being able to occupy all of those different spaces. That space even has a mezzanine that allows a different view and a different individuality or isolation from the rest of the people. So there are many, many degrees or many degrees of scale or hierarchies on how to occupy or how to be in relationship with the pool, with the ocean, with the sand, et cetera, et cetera. So that was sort of natural, but with certain assets that many other buildings don't have. Now, we knew we needed a, a parking lot, a, a parking structure, I'd say. So we always thought that instead of using the, the western part of the site, which is the largest part of the site, only as a, a parking structure, you know, as a service structure, we should really look at it as a, as, a, as a pediment, as a podium for a very rich sort of communal experiences. And that's where you have gardens, you have a, a spaces where people can gather, to play a game of cards, to play domino, or just to read a book or to work on your computer or whatnot. But we also have there a spa, which is an important destination. And we also have there the Western pool. As we know, you know, many of the, of the pools for, because of that, for the pools that are on buildings on the beach end up always in the Eastern side. But you lose the sun on the Eastern side right after one o'clock. You know, after one o'clock, two o'clock, there's very little sun on the eastern side of the, of the pool, of the, of, the, of the building, I would say, because the building starts projecting a shadow over those gardens. So then we decided what happens? You know, there's all these people that use the pool up to six, seven o'clock in the evening and also want to have the sun and the happiness of being out in the sun, sunbathing, sun partying, you know, just being on that condition. So we decided we needed a pool in each end of the of the of the of the two pools. So if you're really a pool bomb, you can start at nine o'clock in the morning, or you can start even earlier and appreciate the sunrise, and you can end up with the sunset on the other pool, you know, just by having a continuous experience or a series of experiences, of outdoor experiences that somehow become part of your own residential uh, opportunities. Yeah, uh, Seth, I want to add to that because uh, 
one of the things that I, I always disliked in life is tokenisms. And, and you know, tokenisms exist everywhere. And when it comes to amenities or luxury, uh, the fact that it's not, it doesn't start with, oh, we have two swimming pools, look at us. That's just the start. So Enrique took that idea and said, well, we have the swimming pool. Well, what about the journey from the interior to the exterior? So he created this wonderful mezzanine area, uh, which can be used for entertainment by the residents. We have a kitchen in there. You can have, you know, an anniversary, a, a bar mitzvah, or just a nice Friday, Saturday night dinner, right? Or a party. And then from there, you go into a sculpture garden that he created. So these sliding glass walls open up to now take you to the sculpture garden where you can just walk around and admire or sit and read. And then uh, he created this standalone rooftop pavilion, which is our spa. So that structure in itself and how beauty has to be admired from within and from without. So you can't just say I have a spa, but what does that spa look like? And I remember having this discussion with Enrique and I said, look, one of my favorite things about formal French gardens uh, and Italian Renaissance gardens is the idea of a folly. And, and often these formal gardens would introduce a, a, a fake uh, classical temple in there or a copy of a classical temple. And this would be a folly. It's something, it's structure that you would come upon. And it's, it's only function was for the viewer to appreciate the aesthetic beauty of the structure in the midst of these gardens. So he put a lot of thought into how does this spa pavilion look in terms of structure and, and, and texture and color and placement with this beautiful rooftop area that we're creating. So you go through a transition of spaces, you have this indoor outdoor space, which is multi-purpose use. You go into a sculpture garden and from there, as you're walking towards the swimming pool, you come across a pavilion, which is the, which houses the spa with a Zen garden, with a hidden Zen garden within that. And then from there, you move on to the pool, which now he designed another wonderful structure, which is an enclosed open bar structure so you can have a very different experience by being in this pool at sunset into the early evening because it's lit up beautifully it's dense foliage uh, there's going to be snacks and drinks served over there and you experience all of this while being at your own home basically and being in a completely transformative environment from where you were five hours ago at the beach and on the sand or the beachside swimming pool and and, and this is what i mean about not having tokenisms. You know, if you had to do it really well or don't do it at all. So it wasn't just about having the two pools. He's being very modest here, but he created a journey on the way to this swimming pool and on the way to the ocean. We have an oceanside outdoor pavilion. So when you take the elevator, you just don't open up into the pool. You go through this indoor outdoor space, your eyes set to the degree of light. And, and the breezes are coming through. And then from there, you go to the outside. So he's been brilliant at creating these transitional spaces. Uh, it's the same with the sense of arrival. You don't just come to the building. You get off the street. You climb this ramp. You have this amazing ramp, which is just going to be spectacular when people see it. I, I see it from some of the people I've taken without the ramp being there just to take to the lobby level with just cement. And people are like, I didn't realize the lobby is this high up. I didn't realize these are the views from the lobby. And, and these are really moments that can only be appreciated when you're there. But the sense of arrival, you go through a transition of elevation and space. The access to the swimming pools, you go through a transition of texture and light and space. And this is difficult to really appreciate unless you're there. But I wanted to emphasize that, that this building has a story. Like Enrique himself, he's very warm, he's very loving, very multifaceted, and he's modest. So I want to say it on his behalf. He's created this journey. There is a journey that you enter upon as you go. If you look at grand old houses, okay? So modern, modern structures, you go in, you open the door in your bedroom and there's no transition. If you look at these beautiful old mansions, there was always an antechamber and then you went into the bedroom because, because transition through space is much more human if you are going through a phasing and you can tell a story. And architecture is about the story of living. It's, it's the most noble of the arts, as they used to say, because everything combined into great architecture. And Enrique has accomplished that narrative telling of, of, of moving between these spaces uh, brilliantly, I, I think. And, and I wanted to emphasize that as we were talking about these two swimming pools. 
Edgardo, um, we had you on the first week that we did our webinar right, right when coronavirus hit Miami. People look to you for direction. What is your thoughts on um, the state of the Miami market and what's your thoughts for the remainder of the year? Obviously, it's, it's hard to have the, the crystal ball, but as I said before, I think that Miami is positioned uh, perfectly to, to capture a, some of the a really fallout, quote unquote, of, of uh, the after uh, coronavirus in the sense that people are going to embrace uh, the lifestyle or where they live a lot more uh, now or after this than, than, than they did before. And uh, how people live and, and the type of, of, of property that people live is going to be a lot more prevalent. So um, the, it's going to take a little while to, to adjust to, to back to normal. I, I hope that, that we find uh, some quick solution to the health issues so people are not uh, concerned anymore and are able to travel. But, but both from the location point of view in Miami and from what the activities that we do, which is real estate, which is a, an investment that has proven through through the ages to be very solid and uh, and really hold value. Um, I, I think that we're in a perfect position to take advantage of that. How long is it going to take? I mean, hopefully they um, they are going to um, to to uh, people are going to uh, experience. Uh, and ease uh, more and more into coming back to normal life. And when they start being able to travel again, I think that, um, that Miami is going to benefit from this. And the still in comparative values to, the, to many of the big cities in the rest of the world, uh, Miami is still a great, great value and, and the potential for acquisitions are great. And buildings like this, uh, that are smaller, that, that uh, are really, um, a lot less dense than, than other major structures are going to benefit uh, also from that. So um, I'm very, very optimistic on, on the future, on the future of Miami and, and the future in general. Um, the U.S. is going to, in my opinion, recover way ahead of the rest of the world and people are going to come and want to be part of this market. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be where we are. Well, that's great to hear. So Shahab, I mean, one of the things that makes Miami special is all these beautiful buildings that um, have been built over the last 20 years. We're very excited for this building and to have Mr. Norton create such a masterpiece in Hollandale speaks of your vision and entrepreneurship. So we want to thank you um, for putting this together with um, Enrique from Mexico City, uh, Shahab, you're in the Hamptons, and Mr. De Fortuna in Miami. Um, we're just really honored to have you guys and speak about your vision about building the project, but also the future post coronavirus. Is there any uh, parting, um, anything you'd like to say before we go today, Shah? I, I, I have spoken of this before and I speak to this from somebody who has personally experienced uh, a sudden change in life. I'm, I'm an, I came to this country as an Iranian Jewish refugee from the Islamic revolution of Iran. Uh, that was a, a much more harrowing experience and a much more real experience than what is going on right now with immediate death, destruction and change and uh, life. And uh, uh, the thing about life is that it has uh, one constant and that one constant is change. And often the fear of what is going to come is greater than what actually happens. Human beings are extremely resilient. Uh, human societies are extremely resilient. If you go back and look at true pandemics, such as the Spanish influenza, the so-called Spanish influenza, the aftermath of World War II, the, 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 the horrors of communism under uh, Mao and Stalin, uh, this really pales by comparison. And I would argue that had we not been living in an age where we have immediate digital access and information and we didn't have gene sequencing and dissemination of information at the speed of light, this could have been called a really nasty flu season and would have moved on from it. Many lessons to be learned here. Uh, I agree 100% with Gardo. I am living proof of it. And I think Edgardo is also the opportunities that exist in the US are second to none anywhere else in the world. Uh, we will be ahead of the curve 
Uh, I hope the whole world will be uh, fine to back where it was and prosper. I wish that for everybody. I think we have certain built-in advantages in the U.S. And especially in Florida and in the Miami market, we benefit from all the other factors that we touched upon. So uh, I am optimistic. I'm, by nature, I'm optimistic. I think to be a developer, you have to be optimistic. But if you look at the historical data, if you look at have an understanding of what has come before, this is, this is not a smooth ride, but I, I think we're, we're on the other side of this and uh, we need to get on and get moving. And, and I think the future uh, is, I hope, and I think is brighter than what a lot of other people are, uh, have been thinking. Well, Mr. Norton, Shahab, Egardo, April, I really appreciate everyone's time today and thank you so thank you. much. Thank you very much, guys. Yes, thank you, Seth. You, you, Hard Living has always been a great partner, so I really appreciate it because you really um, emphasize what Miami and, and luxury is all about. So thank you for the great job you guys are doing. Thank you to all you visionaries to keep. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Enrique. Thank, thank you. Sam. Thank you. Great to be with Good you, to see you. Always. Good seeing you in person, Eduardo. I hope uh, so. And, 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 yeah. Come down. <laughs> Take care, guys. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.